Live from Quito, Ecuador. I'm Sony Gray and this is from the South, the evening news brief from Tell Us Your English. We start this new edition right now. Another leak of confidential financial papers is rocking the rich and powerful around the world. And it could have implications for the Caribbean too. Just a little more than a year after the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers are shedding light on who's investing huge amounts of money in offshore tax havens. One of the many people implicated in the scandal is Queen Elizabeth II. According to the files, her estate has invested millions of dollars in medical and consumer loan companies. Londoners reacted to the report that implicated the UK's monarch. For me what this says most of all is that the public is desperately in need of uh, figures who represent integrity whether it's from politics or business uh, and we're seeing increasingly that the sort of integrity that the public wants is very seldom matched by the, the, the business and political leaders that we have. Colombia's president Juan Manuel Santos is another of the 127 world leaders so far implicated in the Paradise Papers, which came from the law firm Appleby, based in Bermuda. According to the investigation conducted by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, or the ICIJ, President Santos was in control of two offshore companies in Barbados. Santos has denied the allegations, saying he never invested a single peso in the companies mentioned. Earlier I spoke to Tov Maria Riding, the policy and advocacy manager at Tax Justice in Brussels, and asked what could be done about tax havens. Uh, just like when we had a global climate crisis, we asked our governments to go to the United Nations and get a climate agreement. And now we have a crisis in our tax system. So of course we need a global agreement to fix this problem. But unfortunately we're seeing many governments that are busy trying to compete with each other on being the best tax haven in the world instead of working together. So politically, we're not quite there yet, but the, a global agreement is definitely the way ahead. And as Dominica faces its new reality as a country that has been and will continue to be severely affected by climate change, it's taking steps to boost its environmental management. Since Tropical Storm Erica in 2015, Dominica had engaged with the Caribbean Development Bank to commission a study on the island's flood-prone areas to identify vulnerabilities and offer practical solutions. Chief en Engineer Magnus Williams of Duasco explains. Um, we expect coming out of the study, and, and again I mentioned we would also have to do specific studies and designs for each water system um, that we would have to, for instance, look at different sources. We would have to add more storage to our systems. We may have to upgrade our level of water treatment. Um, maybe look at different pipe materials, different methods or techniques for laying our pipes, for securing our pipes, um, for aligning them in areas that they wouldn't be so exposed. Troops from Brazil, Colombia and Peru are beginning joint logistical exercises on their shared frontier in the Amazon. The military exercises are based in the Brazilian border town of T Tabachinga and hosted by Brazil. The United States is backing the Amazon Log 17 exercises and 14 other countries are sending observers. The stated aim is to improve the military response to human humanitarian disasters including the supposed probabil probability of refugees leaving Venezuela, whose border is 600 kilometers from Tapachinga. Including Brazil, there are 18 countries involved. The main objective is to achieve operational integration and cooperation and mutual trust. We think that if we are able to achieve these logistics in an area as remote as Tabatinga, to carry out humanitarian operations, we will also be able to deploy all these resources for any kind of operation. Our correspondent in Brazil, Adriana Robrenio, has more on these military exercises. 
The military exercise in the Brazilian Amazon, a military base, is already there, which, according to organizers, is going to be a provisional one. Close to 1,600 members of the Brazilian Armed Forces, along with Colombian and Peruvian, are doing joint exercise in Tabatinga, an area in the Amazonas state, right in the triple border between Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. Also, besides these countries, the United States will also participate with logistical resources. A Hercules C-130 cargo plane, a camp kitchen, and a water purifying station. Also, with the presence of the representatives from the National Guard and from the Southern Command, which is an important unit of the U.S. Army. There is also observers from other countries, even from Europe. But logically, the presence of the United States is the most highlighted element because the alleged objective of the troop de deployment is providing eventual humanitarian aid. But the U.S. military allegedly has its sights on the border between Brazil and Venezuela, located relatively close to where the Amazon logging is taking place. Another subject they say they want to highlight is the fight against drug trafficking, which is very common in the border area. The U.S. presence has been the target of criticism by politicians, analysts, and intellectuals because of all the military deployment. They say the security and defense policies implemented in 2003 by Lula's government are changing since President Dilma Rousseff was displaced by Temer's unelected government. For example, Temer's government plans to give the Alcantara military base to the U.S. This base is in the state of Maranhão and it's considered strategic for the launching of space rockets because it's very close to the Ecuador, something that would allow the placement of the satellites in orbit very quickly, saving fuel and money. This is an example of how things are changing in terms of military strategies and collaborations. We will be here to inform you about everything related to the Amazon logging military exercise, with special attention to the U.S. military presence in the region. A report from Adriana Robreño. Nicaragua's ruling Sandinista party has won a resounding victory in Sunday's municipal elections. With almost all of the votes counted, the Electoral Council says the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or the FSLN, has won 68% of the vote, giving it 134 of the 153 mayors across the country. The Independent Liberal Party won 12 town halls and two smaller parties won five. International experts validated the electoral process, saying it happened naturally. Our correspondent, Maria Jose Diaz, tells us more from Managua. International electoral experts reported on the electoral process, stating that it occurred normally. They highlighted the massive attendance of people and high participation of women and youth. They recognized that the ballot was clear as well as the census and supported the way in which the work had been done. They exposed 17 topics about the electoral process and made six recommendations, one of which was the use of a biometric system in the future. We await the final report from the Supreme Electoral Council. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. Five, almost 100 people were killed and over 10 others disappeared after an armed confrontation between the government and M19 guerrillas during an attempt to retake the Justice Palace. 32 years later, family members of the victims are still waiting for justice. Our correspondent Milton Hinao files this report. We are at Plaza de Bolivar with the Justice Palace right behind us, where 32 years ago at least 99 people died and 12 disappeared after an armed confrontation between the M19 guerrilla group 
and the state as they try to retake the Justice Palace from the hands of the guerrilla. We are here with Alejandra Rodriguez, family member of one of the victims. Alejandra, after 32 years, you are still asking for justice and for the truth. For us, this is a fight that will never end. We've had a few answers after 32 years. Six of the 12 that disappeared during all this time are with us today, but at the same time, others have disappeared as well. Still today, we have doubts on what really happened that day at the Justice Palace, what happened to our family members. The state doesn't want to give us clear answers on the details of that day. The Inter-American Court condemned the Colombian state. Why is the state blamed for what happened? The Colombian state was condemned in 2014 after 29 years of what happened that day. The state was condemned for the forced disappearance of 12 people, the torture of four others and one extrajudicial execution. The court is asking the state to find these people as well as to investigate the facts. Regarding the search, the state has made some efforts, but regarding giving us justice and truth, the state hasn't done anything even though there is a sentence against the people responsible for the disappearances. According to the family members of the victims, this is the summary. Eleven of those who passed away that day were judges working at the Justice Palace. Their bodies were given to their families at the time, although recent findings suggest that some of the bodies were not those of the victims. This is all from Plaza de Bolívar. Milton Hamel with that report. The Venezuelan government says it fully respects the need for parliamentary immunity, but it is up to the courts to decide on specific cases. The declaration comes after Venezuela's Supreme Court lifted the parliamentary immunity for Freddy Guevara, a leader of the Pop Popular Will Opposition Party, who is accused of inciting the violent protests of earlier this year, which claimed the lives of over 100 people. Guevara has sought asylum in the Chilean embassy in Caracas. El comunicador social de 31 años es dirigente del Partido Voluntad Popular liderado por Leopoldo López. Our correspondent Reagan Devines joins us now live from Caracas. Hello Reagan, so what's the latest on Freddy Guevara? Hi, so in Ignite our viewers and tell us through English, the latest news is that Freddy Guevara his presence was demanded in front of the National Constituent Assembly by President of the ANC, um, Delcy Rodriguez. Um, we're uncertain at this point whether or not he showed up, whether or not he received the communique, the demand, the order. Um, he has not responded as far as we know. Normally he responds to every and anything on Twitter, on social media. We have not seen anything posted on Twitter since November 3rd. Also, his uh, party, Voluntad Popular, he's the leader of the party, they have not said anything in terms of or given a response to this request by the National Constituent Assembly that Freddy Guevara appears in front of them to answer um, for some allegations, including association with uh, violent garimbas, as well as for the use of adolescents to commit a crime. Now, these are serious. Freddy Guevara has been a thorn in the side of the government all year. He was instrumental. He was one of those persons who inspired, whether or not it was deliberate or not, he inspired some violence, some violent ultra-right-wing activists, supporters of the Mud Coalition. And of course, we all know by now that, they, that all of this resulted in the deaths of some 120 people. Now, last week Friday, as you said, the Supreme Court ordered that he not be allowed to leave the country and that uh, in response he fled. He fled to the Chilean embassy here in Caracas um, and so they've been protecting him thus far. But as far as we know he has not shown up in front of the National Christian Assembly at the request of, the, of that president and so hopefully tomorrow we'll have some more information um, on that front. Soini. Okay so thanks for that. That is Reagan Devines in Caracas, Venezuela. Mexicans from the border cities of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso gathered to hear an open-air mass on the banks of Rio Bravo. They prayed for migrants who have died as they tried to cross into the United States in pursuit of the American dream. The faithful had signs that read, for all migration victims and for a world without walls and without borders. Millions of migrants living in the U.S. face an uncertain future after U.S. President Donald Trump decided to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, program.
also in Mexico. The fight against mining and its consequences is happening in various parts of the country, including at some of its most important historical monuments. Details in this report. With the Teotihuacan pyramids as background, the neighbors of one of the most important archaeological sites in the nation are protesting against irregular mining and what it's bringing upon their communities. They're devastating our environment. They're causing heavy environmental impacts with extracting so much tenochtle, so much material in all these municipalities, devastating our mountains. From the hills, they extract rock being used for the construction of the new airport of Mexico City, where they're destroying the way of life of the villagers. People from this town work the land, looking for larves and mangay worms to sell, and now they're ruining everything. Rock mines are operating illegally in many cases without regard for the communities, which makes the damage to their patrimony and health more evident. When communities realize this, as they see their trucks in the streets, they get organized and block the road or protest. This is the only way to get the authorities to do something. The villagers that in many cases follow the old traditions and customs of the Mexican people have clear requests. I only ask for one thing, for authorities to respect the human rights of my people, for our children to breathe clean air, and our grandchildren not to go thirsty if they ruin our water. An estimated 6,000 tons of rock has to be extracted to build a new airport, a project that has been certified as non-viable from various experts and organizations, but it has been a part of President Peña Nieto's agenda since he was governor of the state of Mexico. The bodies of the five Argentinian victims of the New York terror attack have returned home to Rosario, Argentina. A funeral procession of locals, friends and family accompanied the hearses through the streets of the victim's hometown. The group of 10 old college friends were visiting New York to celebrate their 30-year graduation anniversary together. In Paraguay, the National Campesino Federation and the Paraguay Party have mobilized to demand the release of Hinaro Mesa, a campesino leader who is imprisoned and accused of being part of an insurgent group. The groups have confirmed that is, there is no evidence to incriminate Mesa. Our correspondent in Asuncion has the details. Allies of the campesino leader, Genaro Mesa, spoke out against the oppressive security forces that broke into his home and arrested him. For social organizations, the evidence presented against Mesa does not stand up. Joint task forces, along with some prosecutors, Casal and Torres, broke into Comrade Mesa's home with the purpose of imprisoning him, and now they are presenting supposed evidence that makes no sense. According to the National Campesino Federation, these types of arbitrary accusations seek to besmirch and to put a stop to social movements that are fighting to achieve a better quality of life for the impoverished majority. For us, as an organization, we can see that this setup intends to slander social and political movements that want a different country, where we have access to good health and education. We believe this is their true intention, best merchant organizations by using Genaro Mesa's case. Horacio Cartes' government modified the national defense law in 2013. Through this law, he has militarized the northern region of Paraguay in order to combat the Paraguayan People's Army. Ever since then, there have been accusations that point towards state terrorism. For us, this case is state terrorism. Furthermore, we believe that Cartes' oppressive system is much more dangerous. And that's what we want the Paraguayan people to know. Organizations like Servicio de Paz and Justicia Paraguay, as well as Paraguay's coordinator of human rights, have asked Congress to repeal the law that allows the militarization of different areas in the country, given all the wrongdoings that have happened over the past few years. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Russia is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Great October Revolution as their people remember the legacy the socialist ide ideology left in the country. More than 300 people gathered near the monument of Georgi Zhukov, a military strategist and marshal of World War II, to remember the legacy that the Great October Socialist Revolution left in Russia and to celebrate its 100th anniversary. I think Marx and Lenin's ideas are alive. The ideas of social equality and the creation of a better society are immortal. They will live forever and they will conquer. The leader of the Communist Party in Russia left a floral offering in the grave of the unknown soldier as a sign of respect to all of those who lost their lives fighting for the socialist ideology. The October Revolution and Lenin saved the empire after the First World War. Lenin allowed the country to take a new shape, the great state of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics that became a light in the world. The October Revolution and Lenin brought modernity. According to Siogonov, the Soviet state produced 20% of the products sold worldwide during the socialist era and the government designed a social system that protected the nations that were part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It is in this mausoleum where the body of leader of the great October Socialist Revolution, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, rests. Representatives from communist parties and leftist organizations came to Russia to pay tribute to the person that awoke 100 years ago the political conscience and fight of the workers. We are here reaffirming our revolution the fight of Cuba that will keep on resisting, all to protect what was born here during the October Revolution and that should persist all around the world. At the concert room of the Luzniki Stadium, around 7,000 people enjoyed the performances of orchestras and dance groups, a tribute to the centenary of the socialist ideas that took place in the capital of Russia. Palestinian fishermen and farmers continued to be attacked and harassed by Israeli forces despite a truce agreement brokered by Egypt in 2014. Our correspondent Noor Harazin has the details. The Israeli Navy opened fire on fishing boats off the coast of the northern Gaza Strip on Sunday, forcing unarmed Palestinian fishermen to sail back to shore in fear for their lives. Local sources confirmed that no injuries or damages were reported in the incident. The Israeli occupation's naval vessels opened heavy fire this morning toward the boats of Palestinian fishermen in Gaza Sea. Israel aims behind these military practices to prevent Gaza fishermen from earning their living and force them to dock back to shore without achieving their work. Dozens of Palestinian boats desperately sailed back to shore this morning without achieving any work. In Khan Yunis, in the southern Gaza Strip, Israeli bulldozers raised Palestinian agriculture lands adjacent to the border fence under the protection of Israeli army troops. Israeli incursions into Palestinian lands in the Gaza Strip and near the border fence occur on a near daily basis in flagrant violence of a truce agreement which ended a 50-day war between Israel and Hamas militants in 2014. Under the agreement, Gaza fishermen, whom number around 4,000, are supposed to sail up to six nautical miles of the shore in the Gaza Sea. However, Gaza fishermen routinely come under fire by Israeli naval boats before they reach its limit. The practice has largely destroyed fishing and agriculture sectors in the territory, which has been suffering a tightened Israeli blockade since 2007. Nuhar TV, Gaza. Kenya's opposition rejects the legitimacy of the repeat presidential elections, in which they didn't participate. They pr propose to create a resistant movement to open a new electoral process. The electoral farce has ended, said the opposition leader Raila Odinga. Today, we return to the hard but essential task of making elections count and democracy work in Kenya. What he suggests is to invalidate the elections by organizing assemblies of popular resistance. We will not allow two megalomaniacs 
to destroy the dream of freedom and democracy. To destroy the dream of freedom and democracy that generations have sacrificed and worked so hard for. The opposition alliance is in favor of dialogue, as long as the result is to organize fair and credible elections. With that purpose, Raila Odinga announced the creation of popular parliaments in order to defy the Uhuru and Rutu's government. Economic boycotts, peaceful possessions, picketing, and other legitimate forms of protest. If there is no justice for the people, let there be no peace for the government. The political crisis in Kenya continues, but after the violent scenes last week during the elections, the leaders from both sides of the divide insist on looking for future solutions by exclusively peaceful means. And now here are the, some, of, some of the other news stories from around the world. Law enforcement officials are continuing their investigation of the Texas church shooting that killed at least 26 people, including children, and wounding at least 19 others who were hospitalized on Sunday. Authorities are still trying to identify the motives that led a white male to enter the church firing an assault rifle. The suspect has been identified as Devin Patrick Kelly, who police say died after he shot himself. Iran has been accused by the Saudi-led coalition fighting Houthi rebels in Yemen of being involved in firing a ballistic missile that was intercepted by Saudi air defenses on Saturday. However, Iran has rejected these accusations, saying the claim was both malicious and irresponsible. Saudi Arabia says it will close all Yemeni ground, air and sea ports while it carries out an investigation into how the missiles were smuggled to Houthi rebels. Still in the Middle East, where Iran has accused Saudi Arabia, Israel and the U.S. of trying to incite tension in the region. Iran made the accusation after Lebanese Prime Minister Saeed Hariri resigned over the weekend. During his televised announcement, Hariri cited concerns for his life and blamed Iran and his close Lebanese ally Hezbollah for meddling in Arab affairs. Hundreds of environmental activists converged on the Hambach coal mine in western Germany on Sunday to demand that the government phase out the extraction and production of coal for energy. The demonstration took place not far from where the COP23 conference is being held. One protester explained what they hope to achieve. So the objective is just to shut down this coal mine. It's the biggest lignite um, mine in Europe. And obviously there's um, COP23 happening in Bonn. Um, really close by and it's sort of this big contradiction of Germany trying to say that oh, it's like really very progressive in terms of its climate policies but actually it has this massive coal mine that's really destructive to the environment. We've come to the end of this evening's news brief. For these and many other stories you can find them on our website tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But tell us your English. I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.